because that symbol represents the keys that the word of God speaks about when Jesus and Peter were having the conversation, who do men say I am? Who do you say that I am? And when Peter received revelation from Holy Spirit and he spoke who Jesus in fact was and Jesus said, flesh and blood are not giving this to you. Ultimately, he said, because of that, I'm changing your name. And then me changing your name from Simon to Peter, I'm going to build upon the rock that is the revelation that Holy Spirit gave you and that you received and believe of who I am. I'm going to build on that. And I'm going to build on that to the point where I'm going to give you the keys. And this is symbolic of the keys. What God desires us to do, which is why we're talking about keys in this series, he desires us to have universal keys that could bind and loose and lock and unlock and, and put us in a position to walk in dominion. And we want to talk tonight about spiritual keys in the life of, of, of Peter. And the thing that I found most interesting about Peter in everything that, that we've discussed and everything that we've said about Peter, all of which is true, is that Peter functioned a lot in his life on experience. And his experience is actually what led him to begin to write the pastoral letters, uh, primarily the primary of which first and second Peter. And the pastoral letters are basically glimpses into experiences in his life, glimpses into life experience. And when you're reading an experiential letter, a letter that's been written from experience, from a man or from a woman of experience, you read it differently. It, it, it hits you differently because you're not only taking it at face value, word for word, what it's saying, but you're reading it against the backdrop of, of, of having an, an idea of who the person is. So by seeing Peter and how Peter lived and by understanding the nature and the characteristics, his boldness, his, his um, radicalism, if you will, his willingness to speak was on his mind, his willingness to to act first and ask questions later, his willingness to be in the forefront and to be a doer and not just a thinker, not just a hearer. It, it puts you in the mindset of this is a man of action. So when we read about the different spiritual keys in his own life that he drew from living a life of action, they, they, they carry a different weight. And there are four of them that he wrote about in his pastoral letters that as he wrote about them, he wrote about them from having lived them. And I want to look at them tonight because these are keys that as we live, we should strive to live out as well. First key here is found in 1 Peter 1 verses 6 and 7. I'll read it just in case it's a little difficult for you to see. In this you rejoice greatly, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So that the genuineness of your faith, which is much more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested and purified by fire, may be found to result in your praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting when we look at this because there seems to be a formula that's being spelled out here. And that's really the basis of the first spiritual key that we can draw from Peter and from his life. And that key is simply suffering and sacrifice ultimately lead to salvation. So if you take that and write it in an equation form, take suffering, put a plus sign there and sacrifice, that equals sanctification. And like boldness equals faith that have to be equal, not from the standpoint of time per se, but equal from the standpoint of experience, suffering and sacrifice in order to truly have spiritual sanctification. Bible's full of examples of this. In some cases, it was a shorter journey. In other cases, it was a longer journey. In some cases, it involved other people. Other cases, it involved situations and circumstances. But the formula is still there. There had to be a season of suffering, had to be a sacrifice of some sort. And once that was all over with, the sanctification came about. And you might say, well, Pastor, how is that a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because the first thing that we can draw from it is that the equal means that if this happens, this, this is always the result. This is always the result. Sanctification is always the result. Sanctification is always a desire whenever God allows situations to happen to us, whenever God allows circumstances to come into our lives. He's doing so with the intent of getting our attention. 
And he's doing so with the intent of getting our attention to the point so that he can change our lives. If you think back to the uh, original scripture that brought about these keys that were life changing for Peter, it all happened because of two simple questions. Doesn't have to be long and drawn out, doesn't have to be deep. It don't have to be something that necessarily falls out of the sky. It could be as simple as God prompting someone by Holy Spirit to ask a question that this response to which can change your life. That's what happened to Peter. Because before Peter confessed, uh, confessed and proclaimed that Christ was a that, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the Living God, his name was Simon. But because of that profession, it opened the door for Peter to go on a journey that ultimately put him in a position of being sanctified to the point that he was viewed as one of the apostles, the chief apostle, the, the father, some would believe and say, of the Catholic Church. And if you look at it, the, the, the sacrifice and the suffering that came was not only him being um, bound, another word from bound, particularly that's used a lot in Catholicism, is constrained. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm bound, I'm godly bound to serve and to do what it is that God has called me to do as much as my flesh would want to do something different. There's no way I can because this is part of the divine equation that's been set up for my life. Peter was so dedicated to it that other symbols that are used to represent Peter in Catholicism include uh, an image of a man hanging on the cross upside down because that's how Peter was crucified. And he was, he was crucified that way because he didn't view himself to be equal with Jesus in any way. And, and he refused even when death was pronounced in that fashion to, to place himself equal with Christ because he understood and knew in his mind who Christ was. But the beauty of it was that even though he had made that profession, he was God was still honoring him because even though he went through things in life, even though he suffered hardship and challenges in life, even though he did that and even though he opted to pour his life out in that instant as a sacrifice, he was still set apart by God. He was still set apart to be used by God to make a difference in the lives of other people. And God desires us to have that same mindset. I'm not saying that we should go out uh, uh, willingly look, look, looking for hardship, willingly looking for persecution. But what I am saying is think about the Beatitudes and the and Beatitudes. Let us know that we're blessed. Blessed are you. Jesus said, when men shall revile you and persecute you and, and speak all manner of evil against you for my name's sake, the word says to rejoice and be exceedingly glad because that's how the prophets that were before you and I were persecuted. In other words, the suffering is a part of being set apart. The, the sacrifice rather is a part of being set apart. You can't be set apart for God's use if you're not willing to give up something going to cost you something. You're not going to be set apart and be recognized by God as being set apart if you're not willing to stand by your decision, if you're not willing to stand 10 toes down on it. Yeah, I, I've, I've given up this. I've given up that. I've given up my life of sin. I've given up my life of, of living to please my flesh so that I might please my Savior. And folks are going to ridicule you. Folks are going to talk about you. Folks are going to try to do all they can to try to get you to turn away from the path. But the one thing that's true about math, and math is my worst subject, is that simple equations, I don't care what happens, one plus one is still going to equal two. Two times two is still going to equal four. Any number divided by zero, or any number, excuse me, times zero is still going to be zero. Any number divided by one is still going to be is, is itself. There are certain laws and principles when it comes to basic math equations that no matter what's done to it, no matter where it's done, no matter how it's done, the outcome is still the same. This is a spiritual basic equation. Suffering plus sacrifice ultimately leads to sanctification. There's no way we can seek to live sanctified lives thinking that we're not going to go through seasons of suffering and sacrifice. And Peter was trying to let us know as he wrote this in this general this general epistle letter, this pastoral letter, listen, as a leader, as one that's been called by God to shepherd, whether it's a hundred folks or whether it's one person, 
As you strive to be the example, understand that the simple decision to say yes to accepting the assignment that's been given means that you're sacrificing your time, sacrificing your will, sacrificing your energy to intercede, to encourage, to, to stand in the gap for, to, to, to call, to reach out to, to, to just allow an individual to take up brain and heart and spirit space. And it's an, but it's an honor to do that, and it's a blessing to do that. And at times, it can become a, a, a bring about a season of suffering. But it's not a season of suffering. It's like I don't understand why I even did this. It's a season of suffering and understanding that as we go through this season, as we go through this season, us and God first and foremost. But as we go through this season, us and whomever it is we're interceding for, whomever it is we're standing in the gap for is doing two things. Number one is setting us apart for God's use and God's service. Number two is making an impact and a difference in the life of the individuals that we're doing this for. It's yet another aspect of the one individual plants, another individual waters, but it's God that provides the increase. I remember there, there used to be a, a, a type of water, and it may still be on the market, um, called distilled water. And they, and people used to say, well, I'll drink still water. I'll drink still water. Still water better than drinking water. I personally never understood the difference in them. But from what little bit I understand about the distilling process, there's an additional process that goes forth with the intent of once the process is over, the water is, is supposed to be deemed pure, it's supposed to be deemed free of impurities that the naked eye might not be able to see or that one might not be able to pick up at, at when they taste it and drink the water, but there's something in it that can have an impact on the outward man. And our being sanctified works the same way. Our being set apart by God means we went through the steps of being set apart. We went through the steps of being distilled and all the impurities taken out of us so that God can use us in such a fashion so that when he presents himself to others through us and our witness, what can happen is that as those individuals receive the Jesus is in us, it can go in and, and begin to do the work in those individuals. And in some cases, it, it transforms and changes those individuals' lives from the inside out. All the impurities, all the sin and everything that's not of God that at one point in time was in them, it comes out. It comes out, and when the new life that Christ brings goes in, First Peter 6 and 7 becomes their experience that in this, in this process of transformation, they can rejoice. I can rejoice because, yeah, even in that instant, I did suffer a little bit. But I, I laid my pride down long enough to let Jesus come in and know it was uncomfortable. Yeah, I might have shared a tear. Yeah, I might have coughed some stuff up and spit some stuff out. But you know what? The word is now true for my life. If any individual be in Christ, they're a new creature. They're a new creation. And God's desire is to use us to usher in the day of new creating in the lives of other people that don't know him. But there's no way that he can use us to do that unless and until Peter lets us know we go through the process. We can't expect to have a life changing impact on people if our lives hasn't been changed. By our experience with with God through Jesus Christ. Any comments, anything that you would like to add or share at this time? Nothing to add at this time. Okay. So suffering is part of it. And, and, and Peter, if you go back and look at his life long after the, the denial three times, Peter went through some stuff in, in, in being one of the first round of apostles and being the apostle that ultimately planted what is now known as the Catholic Church, being the one that, that, that carried those keys, the first carrier of the keys of binding and loosing. And understand, physical keys, maybe, maybe not, we don't know. But more importantly, spiritual keys that we all have access to because of the revelation knowledge that we've all been allowed to experience. 
So when we have that type of knowledge that comes our direction, and when we have that type of power that's that's given to us, life-changing power, name-changing power, and our names are changed too, because when we say yes to Jesus, the word says, I paraphrase that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and in some instances, in some instances, there's a new name that, that, that that's carved in places that, that may be a name that's referencing us. We don't know because we're not there, but it's a name that, that only God knows, only Christ knows. So when he calls us and he calls us by name, we may not even realize the magnitude of what he's calling us to and what he's calling us into. Because in Jewish culture, names mean something. And I found as I've taken the time to begin to explore and look up what individuals names mean, that once I look up what the name means and I just think about the individual going back to where we started. And it blows my mind. The name fits the personality of the individual. And I've done it with people that I know. I've done it with people that I, I have an acquaintance with. And it fits. And I'm not talking just generalities. I'm talking specifics. It fits. So names carry weight. So for God to, to, to have given us a new name and, and to have blessed us to have a life-changing encounter, and have blessed us to receive the revelation and, and in turn receive the keys. We got to know that persecution is coming. The enemy is going to be coming at us full tilt because he knows now we are public enemy number one to his spiritual agenda here in the earth. Which leads us to the second key that based on experience, Peter learned about and wanted to make sure he captured and wrote down. And the second key is, is to not allow persecution to hinder our spiritual progress. Don't allow persecution to hinder your spiritual progress. First Peter 4 and 19 says in the Amplified, therefore those who are ill-treated and suffer in accordance with the will of God must continue to do right and commit their souls for safekeeping to the faithful creator. This really it builds upon what we talked about at first when we talked about the equation. You know, back, 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 back here when we talked about the equation, suffering and sacrifice just builds on it because the basic equation is suffering and sacrifice. But then number two, the persecution that comes as a result of that. And it's born out here in 419. Therefore, who those who are ill treated and suffer. So the sacrifice is going to be good treatment. The sacrifice is going to be being treated well, being popular. But the suffering is going to come because of what comes as a result of that ill treatment. You might be lied on. You might be persecuted. You might be yelled at. might be laughed at. might be struck. You might be worse. But those who are ill treated and suffer in accordance with the will of God, with the will of God, the persecution that comes is not designed to be our end. Please understand, the persecution is not the destination that God has for us. It is just a stop on the journey to our destiny in God. Let me say that again. The persecution, which is what the enemy wants us to believe, the persecution is not the final destination that God has for us as believers, but it's just a stop on our journey to our destiny in him. It's part of our life as believers. It's a part that the, the flesh doesn't want to make welcome. But as believers, we have to understand its purpose and realize that it's a means to an end. And as a result, as crazy as it sounds, welcome it. What am I saying? I'm saying welcome it from the standpoint of embracing it and realizing that it's serving a much higher and greater good, a much higher and greater purpose. And quite honestly, we're built for it. Because remember, Jesus changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter. Peter in the Greek is from the Greek word Petra. Petra is an offshoot of the Greek word petros, which means stone. So petra is a smaller stone or it's a rock. And upon this rock, not only the revelation of who 
Christ is, but upon this new, newly created form of what Simon once was in this distilled new and improved form. In this new and improved form of who you are, I can now build my church upon it because now it's formulated. Now its DNA has been changed and its makeup is designed to deal with the pressure, to deal with the weight, to deal with the, the, the coarse treatment, to deal with the rolling around in the dirt that can happen sometimes as rocks shift under structures, but not break. Persecution, what persecution does is it strengthens us. Persecution strengthens us. Persecution perfects us. Persecution uh, 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 toughens us up so that we can be all that God has created us to be and be resolved to do the work that God has given us to do. And what we have to do, though, is not allow our flesh to get back in the driver's seat. And we can't allow discouragement uh, to distract us from, from living holy. Holy living is the key to maintaining that formula. Holy living is the key that keeps the main thing, which is serving God through being obedient to Christ and being led by the Holy Spirit, the main thing. Because as we do that and make those things the main thing, what happens is that God can then come in and he can then change our perspective. He can change our focus and he can help us see and understand that it's not about us. It's not about our level of suffering. It's not about our level of going through. But again, it serves a much bigger purpose because it's being done, but it's being done in accordance with something. We're just ending at least the primary election season here. The election day was was last night here in, in, in Milwaukee and all the commercials that saw on TV, all kinds of promises made. You know, some promises were said were kept, would, would be kept. Other promises said will never be kept. But no matter what was being said at the end of the commercial, whomever was running the commercial would always say, I'm such and such and I approve of this message. So there's no message that went out that that candidate was not aware of. And if a message did go out that that candidate was not aware of, guess what? That message, it might have aired once, but it didn't air a second time. So whatever persecution we're facing, it is not an end. It's a means to an end because there's nothing that's going to happen anywhere in the earth, under the earth, behind the earth, at any place that God does not know about because he created it all. He created it all. And not only did he create it all, but he made a special spot in the midst of everything as he wills to place you and I. When it starts getting hectic and starts getting heavy, the word tells us about, as I paraphrase, give me the resolve, God, to run to the rock that's higher than I. In other words, let me go to the place where I can either go under you and find shelter or you lead me so that I can get on top of you and be above whatever the circumstance is, because a rock has the capacity a strong rock has a capacity to be sheltered or to be a platform to elevate. And God wants us to not allow persecution to hinder our spiritual progress because each time we go through uh, suffering, each time we have to make a sacrifice, each time we allow that equation to be proven out and we become more and more sanctified for God, what he's doing is he's strengthening us because as we um, set apart more and more for him, more of his essence becomes our essence and more of our weak essence and, and, and flimsy essence is, is covered by the essence of God. And we begin to take on God's nature, which means things that in and of ourselves we're not able to bear. We can now not only bear, but we can thrive in that environment. But ultimately to do that, it takes a, 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 another little word that, that Peter at times um struggle with, but overall he demonstrated, and that's trust. Faith is blind trust in God, and Peter had boldness, but Peter was also trusting. Peter was trusting all the way from, from, the, from the initial inception of being called by God, being called by Jesus to come follow him. Simon was successful. Simon was successful in doing what it was that Simon did. Simon fished. He, he was successful. He's good at it. He had, had, a, had a fleet. But what we've got to understand and realize is that no matter how successful we in and of ourselves 
feel we are, we'd be nothing without God. And Jesus meets us where we are for a reason. He meets us where we are to help us see and understand that where we are is not our destination. It's not our end. It's a stop along the journey. Whether we're walking with him or one chooses not to walk with him, it's not your end. It is a stop on the journey. And God's desire is for us as he brings us to these different stops in our living. And as we experience persecution in these stops, these stops are not designed for us to get anything. These stops are designed for us to give everything. What I mean by that is this. These stops are not designed for us to get depressed, to get in despair, to get discouraged, to get so out of sorts that we stop moving forward. But these stops are designed for us to give hope, to give encouragement, to give love, to give it all we've got, to let our light so shine before men and women that they might see his good works and give him glory. It's not always designed to be a, a, a raw, raw session for us to be encouraged. Many times it's for us to go and pour out so that others might be filled. And sometimes that's difficult to do when you're stretching to get that last mile, stretching to get that last witness, stretching to get that last ministry gift and ministry opportunity done. When I, when I drive my, my, my truck, I mean, I, I see the gas light come on and Depending on what I'm doing, there was a point in time where before it came on, I stopped and get gas. Of late, what's been happening is the gas light will come on. I'll be okay, I got this many miles. Got 30 miles. I got 20 miles. Got 10 miles. Finally, the vehicle's like, look, you need to stop like right now. Otherwise, neither one of us are going anywhere. There are far too many of us that are allowing persecution to keep us at a standstill, to keep us from moving towards what it is that God has for us or back towards God to be refilled. And God is saying, I need you to keep on moving because even though you feel like your tank is almost empty, I've given you enough gas to get back to me. I've given you enough gas to get to me in prayer. I've given you enough gas to get to me in study. I need you to make wise choices and I need you to let me fill you again. I need you to understand that the persecution wasn't designed to, to zap you of all your strength and leave you empty on the side of the road. It was designed to, yes, you expend the strength, but as you sacrifice that energy, what you're doing is sowing seed into others that, that they might grow and that they might come to understand that there's a trust system in place here. I don't know if you've ever been to... um. I'm sure you've been, been to a con consignment shop, basically been to a place where um, you, you buy stuff and the stuff that you buy is basically stuff that people own and they brought it to the shop. And the thing that makes consignment shops so awesome is that a consignment shop, in essence, is built on trust. And what I mean by that is this. If you've ever donated to a consignment shop, you're donating to a consignment shop and I know the consignment shop in my neighborhood when I was growing up and was old enough to understand it worked this way. You bring items into the consignment shop. The consignment shop looks at them and they see if they're really worth, you know, um, putting on the floor because you just can't put just anything in a consignment shop. And if the things were found to be worth putting on the floor, what would happen is there'd be a a little mini contract drawn up between you as the individual that owns the property because you never stop, you don't stop owning it until it's been bought for the designated price. And the shop, which is has the sole purpose of housing this item until it's bought for a price. And basically the contract is saying in plain English, this is an agreement between us that you trust that we're going to do all that we can to make sure that what you're placing in our care is consistently presented in such a way so that eventually someone will find value in it and will pay the set price for it so that we both benefit from it. The key to trust is to understand that trust is an agreement on both sides so that ultimately there's mutual benefit. 
we have the greater portion of benefit in the salvation equation. God's benefit is we're reconciled back to him. He never wanted to lose us. Sin is what separated us. Our benefit is that we're reconciled to God and we have the capacity to not only see him again and be with him again in glory on that great day, but we have the capacity to make a difference in the lives of other people as we head towards our date of transition to get back into God's presence. Verses 8 and 9 in, in Peter, in uh, 1 Peter 1 puts it this way. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not ever see him, though you not even see him now, excuse me, you believe and trust in him and you greatly rejoice and delight with inexpressible and glorious joy, receiving as a result the outcome, the consummation of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's per First Peter 1 verses 8 and 9 in the Amplified. So going back to Peter's life, like the consignment shop, what happens that when Jesus said, follow me, Peter was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to follow you. I, I don't know you. I, I, I have no understanding necessarily of your history, but I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. I'm, I, I trust you. There's something about you that I trust, and I'm going to follow you. And as that happened, what was happening is that unbeknownst to them, they were making a, a covenant. They were making a, a spiritual covenant. They were making a spiritual contract, if you will, with Christ and saying, Christ is like, okay, I know that you see who you are in this moment, in this state, but I see something much greater in you. I see something so much bigger in you, and I'm committed to walking out by example the way that you need to go so that when the appropriate time comes, I can buy you with a price. I can buy you with the right price. And once that's done, the mutual benefit will be made manifest because the mutual benefit will be that you are now reconciled back to me and you'll spend eternity with me. The benefit for you is that you are, you, you, you are now reconciled back to the Father. And now you can be a blessing to others and lead others to me also. So not only is your place in heaven secure, but you have the capacity to lead others to the point of decision so that they can say yes to me and their place in heaven is secure. The word talks about a wise individual leaves an inheritance, leaves an inheritance rather for his or her children's children. What better legacy to lead? than a legacy that understands the whole premise and concept of trust and faith in God. Trust and faith in God through trust and belief in Jesus Christ. Because like it says in the verse, though we've not physically seen him, none of us have physically seen Christ, but we know he's there. We know the work that he's done. We know the work that he continues to do in our lives. We may not even see him now, but we trust him. I don't I don't make it a point to go. By, I didn't make it a point the few times I did it to go by the consignment shop every day to see if that jacket was still in there. I didn't go looking for it because I had a contract and I knew that when the right price was paid. I'd be notified that that contract has now been satisfied and now I can come collect on what belongs to me. Our salvation is a contract. Our salvation is a contract that we're bought and paid for. We're not our own. The word says it. No, you're not that you're, that that you're not your own, but you've been bought with a price. The price was his shed blood on Calvary. And what Peter came to realize is that the only trustworthy source of joy that any individual can have in this life is Jesus Christ. Because he is the only way. He's the only one that will never, ever, ever fail you. He's the only one that will never, ever, ever let you down. Does that mean that he did not deal with people? Absolutely not. Did not mean that. But what it meant is that he was able to place people, places, things, everything in proper perspective in relation to God through Christ. People are going to be people. People are going to do what they do. But at the end of the day, I need to be in right standing with my Savior because that's where the real joy comes from. 
the biblical joy dynamic, the biblical joy, the enduring, enabling, eternal joy, the joy that comes from knowing the source. That joy that comes from knowing the source is so much better than the joy that comes from having resources. Everybody that has a job is happy on payday. Those same folks that are happy on payday are usually miserable within 72 hours because the money that they made on Friday is gone on average by Monday. Whether it's bills, whether it's socializing, whether it's special purchases, whether it's a combination of all three. And they find themselves right back in a state of watching and waiting and watching and waiting. And when payday comes, the cycle starts all over again. But when we find our contentment in Christ, we find ourselves like what Paul said, I I've learned in whatever state I'm in here with to be content. In other words, whether I got a lot, whether I have nothing, I have you, God. And having you is enough because I know that no matter what happens in this universe, I can trust you. I trust you because the word says that heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or tittle of your word comes back void. I trust you and I can put my trust in you. And because I can put my trust in you, God, that's how I'm able to be made and molded and forged and, 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 and hardened up and toughened because these things hurt. But in the midst of the pain of persecution, I trust you. These things are uncomfortable. But in the midst of the discomfort of sacrifice and, 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 and suffering, I trust you. Because when my trust is in you, my joy is eternal. Because it's not rooted in happiness. It's not based on what's happening to me. It's housed in contentment. It's housed in me knowing that because you are God and because I know this contract is good because it's sealed in your blood, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when I'm with you, provided I hold up my end of the bargain. Because another thing that would void that consignment relationship is if I just got restless and just gave up and say, you know what, I I'm done. Basically, if I give up my faith, and I'm walking now by sight and not by faith. If I walk past the shop for a week and I see my jacket hanging up in there and nobody has bought it and it's still hanging in the same place it was, and I, you know, and I, and the, the worst part of me gets the better of me, the carnal part of me gets the better of me, and I buy, and I buy into the lie. And nobody's ever gonna buy it. Nobody's ever gonna take it. Nobody wants it. It's too old. It's out of fashion. It's this. It's that. So I'm like, my pride says, well, I'll go get it because I know a place that can hang. It can hang in my closet. But if you stop and think about it, the reason why it's there is because it was hanging in your closet and you never used it. What is it profiting you to say, I got it hanging in my closet, but you never wear it? Or better yet, what blessing did you miss out on by not allowing your not allowing your faith to be exercised and stretched just a little bit more so that you could be developed just a little bit more the very steps that you took in there to take it out of the window the person might have been right behind you that was on their way in to buy it but they turned around and walked out because you took their blessing and blocked your own blessing jesus is the only trustworthy source because as believers, we're called to rejoice when allowed to go through, allowed to suffer for his name and joyfully anticipate his return. In other words, yeah, we might have to suffer. We might have to go through a stretch where we may not have. I've known people that have used consignment shops that used consignment shops before there were uh, apps like 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 Poshmark and this and that where you can sell stuff and it turns around pretty much instantaneously. Before those days, people would go to consignment shops. They they go to to pawn shops and places like that to either get loans for, in the latter case with pawn shop or to to take something that's of value and put in the consignment shop because they knew that once that right price was reached, they had some money coming, but they didn't know when the money was coming. If they believed in it, they believed and trusted the system. They knew that it was going to come, but they couldn't tell you when it was going to come. That's exercising, excuse me, that's exercising faith. And what Peter was writing about here is that in my life experience, I've had to learn in my life experience from failing my Lord. The night of his crucifixion from, from being the subject of the very thing that he prophesied about. 
being the one that I did not want to be. He told me I'd be the one and I didn't want to be that one. And then having to, then, then going and crying about it and weeping about it. And then when he saw me, I'm thinking that he's dissing me by saying this stuff the three times. But in, in reality, I came to realize that he had to undo what I had done. Not for his sake, but for mine. Why would I not trust someone that has that level of love and compassion for me? Why would I not do that? Why would I not be willing to trust that even if I got to go through some stuff? Because I, I can only imagine the, the amount of humiliation and pain that, that Peter felt as Jesus kept asking him the same question over and over again. But Jesus wasn't doing it to hurt Peter. Jesus was doing it to free Peter. And looking at it on the other side, Peter could draw from experiences like this and experiences like other experiences in his life to write and to write this verse with the understanding that we're called to rejoice when we're allowed to suffer for his name. And it's critical to understand those two words, rejoice, that's our response. And the rejoice is not in response to the suffering. The rejoicing is in response to the fact that the suffering is not in control. The Savior is because the Savior is allowing the suffering. The suffering is not calling the shots because the suffering was, was calling the shots. We never know when it will end, but because the Savior is allowing the suffering to happen to make us into what he desires us to be, He's not going to allow it to go on any further than it absolutely has to, to maximally benefit us. In other words, he's not going to allow it to go on any further than it's designed to go on or until the right spiritual price is hit to give the maximum payoff in our lives. The maximum payoff of, of grace or patience or joy or peace or whatever it might be. Because the benefit to us is always more. Always more. Than the benefit to God. Because God has everything. He's doing it for us. That he might be glorified. But we're the ones. We're the ones being saved by him. And he's saving us. So that we might be a reflection of him in the earth. So that others might come to know him. Who wouldn't want to trust. A savior like that who always has our best interest at heart. But with that trust, what we're doing with that trust is that we're giving up our will. We're sacrificing our will, which means we're going to go through seasons of, 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 of challenge. But what we learn in those seasons of challenge, ultimately, is to submit. Any comments? So far, before we go into this last point. No comments. Okay. Okay. Submission is ultimately the, the point that God desires us to, to live in. What I mean by that is submission means that we're fully, we fully yielded our will to God's will. We fully yielded our way to God's way and we fully given our full and complete yes to him. Yes, unconditionally, God, whatever you want for me to answer is yes. And in first Peter five and five. Peter wrote it this way, likewise, you younger men of lesser rank and experience. Be subject to your elders, seek their counsel and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Tie on the servant's apron, for God is opposed to the proud, the disdainful, the presumptuous, and he defeats them. But he gives grace to the humble. And what Peter here is doing is he's pretty much writing his, his, his life mantra, if you will. He's pretty much writing, look, what I've learned in my life is this. Those of you that are younger. Those y'all, y'all, those of y'all that don't have a whole lot of experience, you got a lot of zeal, but not a lot of wisdom. Listen to those of us that 
have lived a little bit longer than you and, and seek our counsel because we've made mistakes that you've not even thought of yet. And we want, we're trying to help you not go through the same stuff that we went through. And what we as believers, we as, as seasoned saints, if you will, are designed to do and are called to do. We're called to walk in a position, in a mindset of submission. We're called to submit ourselves to God. In other words, we're called to let God have his complete way in our lives. Because when we do that, what happens is that now we're living our lives as God provides for us. And what I mean by that is this. We're living our lives in a fashion so that verses like John 3, 16 are manifested in all that we do. You know, we're living a life so that because our love for God is so great, we're willing to sacrifice everything. We're not willing to hold on to anything because we know that whatever we sacrifice and give to God, he's going to return it to us with interest. That's why John 3.16 was so profound when Holy Spirit allowed me to look at it from God's perspective. Because we all know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and he slowed me down. For God so loved the world that he gave, and he made it personal. I love the world so much that I made the conscious choice and decision to have my son leave home in one state and come back in another state. Come back in a state that has altered his appearance, that's altered his purpose, that al that's altered everything about him forever. And I did it not because my son did anything wrong, and I did it not because I was trying to punish him. I did it because I loved you enough. I loved you enough, and in turn, he trusted me enough to volunteer to go. So God is saying, God is desiring us to have that level of submission. And when we, when we really, really get it, when we really, really sit down and look at our own um, photo album of life, we'll, we'll begin to realize that just how awesome God is. And we'll begin to realize that, that all God desires of us, all God desires of us is for us to submit. All God desires of us is for us to be fully and completely committed to him be committed to his workmanship because God's designed each and every one of us specifically for his divine purpose no two of us are exactly alike no two of us have the exact same purpose identical twins have different purposes but the one thing that, that is exactly the same is the end result. And the end result is for us to be effective living witnesses of him so that others might come to know him. Because submission not only invites God's favor into our lives, but it also positions us as ambassadors of the gospel to other people. An ambassador carries a very, very important assignment because the ambassador speaks two languages. An ambassador speaks the native tongue of the country from which he came. And an ambassador speaks the tongue of the individual that he or she is trying to reach and convert to the way of thinking of the nation from which he or she came. In plain English, as ambassadors for Christ, we speak the heavenly language by understanding who God is and by allowing Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And we speak the language of natural man, the sin, sinful fallen man, with the intent of helping the sinful fallen man see that there is a better way. With the intent of helping them rise from the dead of walking in life and through life without Jesus Christ. So when we look at Peter's experiences in life and we look at his life experience and look at all that he said, the, the, these four keys are really the four keys that he wants us to understand. Yes, in the midst of my boldness. Yes, in the midst of my 
person folks out. Yes, in the midst of my denying my Lord. Yes, in the midst of me walking on water and in sink. And yes, in the midst of me understanding and getting the revelation and me having the keys and me founding the church and me doing all these things I did. At the end of the day, all that mattered in, in what I did was understanding that these four keys abounded as I sought to do everything that the Lord led me to do in the midst of my struggles, in the midst of my trials and my tests. I came to understand that suffering and sacrifice lead to sanctification. That's not a one and done proposition. As I sought to go higher in the Lord, I had to go back to that equation because the stakes got higher. And in going back to that equation, I didn't allow persecution to hinder my spiritual progress. But instead, it drove me, it constrained me to going back and realize I had to go back because that equation is still true. And even though the suffering might have been greater, it's necessary because I'm offering up myself so that I could be set apart even more to be used by God. Because thirdly, I understand and trust that as I sow myself, because I know my worth, because God cared enough to send his son to die for me. I know my worth. So as long as I place myself in a position of consignment, eternal consignment, I know that the price has already been paid. I already belong to my Lord and Savior. It's just a matter of me hanging out here in this state until the Lord allows the individual or individuals that he desires to see him through me to come along. That's when I'll come down and I'll do the work that he's given me to do. And I, I'm, the only way I can do it is by submitting myself completely to him. Because he designed me and made me in his image and his likeness. I don't even know all the features I got. I don't even know the full scope of who I am. But he does. And because he does, he can use me to be all that, that he's called me to be so that I can be the blessing that He's called me to be so that when someone someday after I'm gone from here asks the same question about me that I asked as we started, man, what about what about Derek? What about Narika? What about this person? What about that person? They'll say, man, well, you know, this person was. When I think about this person, I think about what would someone say when they hear your name? What's the first thing that pops in their head? If it's not something that pleases God and that lifts up the name of Jesus, we need to go back and check our keys because you're doing this thing Peter's way. It's designed for us to have access to those same keys. That whatsoever we bind on earth that's not like God is bound in heaven and whatsoever we loose on earth that is of God is loosed in heaven. Amen. Amen.